so yeah, welcome everyone to today's session together with Accenture, as you can see also on the image. Um, this event is part of our series Unboxing XR Dev Careers. And I hope you all subscribe to our exabootcamp.eventbrite.page so that you can always get notifications for our upcoming events. Um, yeah, also like we would like to invite you to, if you want to discuss further with other VIA developers and the XR crowd in general, to join our Discord server. Um, you should also receive the invitation in the chat right now. So just a few words about XR Bootcamp. Our objective and our mission is to do the best virtual reality and augmented reality educational courses. And um, how are we doing that? Basically, we are really project port portfolio project focused. So all our courses are taught by um, senior level XR VIR developers. Um, we are focused on getting our beginner level bootcamp graduates jobs afterwards in the industry. And we are doing that by using our a large network um, with many, many companies, um, which are already very big and have grown very strongly like Accenture in the VIA space. And um, yeah, so basically, we also what we just launched is our first um, yeah, pre course, it's basically like a challenge if you want to learn, or if you want to know if you are up for for a virtual reality and augmented reality industry. It's a bit challenging, but it's a free course. And if you really have never coded before, it makes sense to take this basically pre bootcamp coding course challenge. It should, take, should not take you more than four weeks. Um, and you will basically learn the basics of coding and also get a few assignments from easy, medium to hard. And if you're able to basically pass um, most of the assignments, you will be ready for our, for our beginner level bootcamp. So that's a little test for us. And also it will show yourself if you have the right skills to um, yeah, to, to work in the VIR field as a prototyper or as a developer. Um, yeah, so after this basically, uh, yeah, pre pre coding course challenge, um, you can check out our XR Foundations Bootcamp where you basically learn Unity, um, go further into C sharp coding, um, and you get ready basically to build your first portfolio, your project portfolio, which always helps a lot in getting hired. And if you're already more advanced, please feel free to check out our master classes from VR interactions to rendering optimization and also a mixed reality HoloLens class. Um, yeah, so, so basically this is our program um, in 2022. Um, for most of the courses, we're actually doing them two times per year. So feel free to check, um, check upcoming courses or, or stay in touch with us if, if some one of the timings doesn't fit you or if you would like to come earlier or later to a course. Um, we are always reachable by email as well. Hello at exabootcamp.com if you have questions or yeah, or reach personally out to, to me or Ferhan. Um, yeah, and Ferhan, do you want to say something about our student graduation projects? Yeah, maybe um, in the meantime, you can maybe check the uh, sound as well. So I can, uh, my... okay, we can hear that. So perfect. So um, yeah, as thank you everyone, first of all, for joining us today. Um, as Rahan mentioned, we have a wide range of uh, programs for uh, beginner level people, for indie creators, freelancers, as well as professionals. And um, we are creating advanced courses, specific courses based on the uh, current demand of the industry. Uh, we have a large ex um, advisory board and they are actually helping us on that front. And um, the, the project that you are seeing right now is actually not, it might look like it is from an advanced class uh, graduation, uh, but it is actually from our beginner bootcamp. So the, the people who have created this, they have full-time job. Uh, one of them is actually working in a university. The other is working at Salesforce, uh, Thomas and Mohamed. And they created this project after four months being with us in a part-time program. And as you may probably have seen, this is actually a networked a multiplayer project that they have created a game room experience inside that um, up to 20 people can actually join. Um, this is not hand tracking based, but probably their next thing will be hand tracking. And we have also an advanced class about that. But just to show you how actually even a um, person without any coding 
uh, or VR development skills can uh, upskill themselves in such a, a short period of four months. And this program is our advanced VR interactions and hand tracking. So if you want to increase the level of complexity of your project, uh, this class is for you. And uh, maybe we can a little bit listen. If it does a double pinch, a little sphere gets created. So we want to detect a double pinch. How to implement the locomotion system, you will do with hand track and make it fully interactive and responsive. For example, we will start with like the hand UI to use pinching gesture to expand those part dynamic dot product and how it works and what kind of value you can use to detect those events. So let's have a closer look at the actual implementation. So as you see, this is Even virtual. You object object now arm. you actually can still interact with the world that you are creating as a project inside this class, fully controlled with hand physics UI and hand tracking. Maybe we can also open the uh, sound. It uh, has previously worked as the co-founder of Neat Corp, the studio behind award-winning VR game Budget Cuts. Okay, now we need to make a game. I need to add functionality. And adding functionality usually involves a lot of math. And of course, I need to display them in the language of the game because just showing that there was a sofa in the spaceship will break immersion. Fabric seems to have a hard time as soon as we remove the restrictions, all of them react quite nicely. Very interesting little creatures so that you can go to them, grab them, and then dynamically put them back in the trash can. If you have the joystick to control the position of the robotic arm, you have a trigger to activate the pincher. Okay, so I think that's uh, already giving an idea, I guess. So uh, by the way, Roger and Dennis, who's the creator of that class, they have just recently been awarded by OG Awards in two categories, best game and best indie creators worldwide. And really we are proud of them. And we actually created a VR party today. Uh, they are not only celebrating this, but they also uh, celebrate the new game launch called Cybrix in uh, App Lab available on Quest. So, we will have a uh, gathering if you want to join us. It will happen approximately in uh, one and a half hour in alt space. So you can also join us there. So we have back-to-back -back meetings uh, and ses uh, like uh, sessions today. Uh, our team already shared the link if you want to join. So yeah, I mean, um, as you see, the, the students and participants are from uh, companies, individuals, students, recent graduates. So we really, want to push the boundaries and everything is industry project based. That is the reason that companies are really interested. So um, as a like a wrap up before handing over the stage to, to Accenture team, today we have uh, the info session, um, which we are uh, about to do after the Accenture event. And we have uh, also Quest game launch, as I just mentioned. It is also happening uh, right after that at 9 p.m. CET, 12 p.m. PT. And we have, um, uh, there is actually one interesting Unity related multiplayer networking series. We will also have another session with them, which might be interesting for Unity developers here, advanced Unity developers. And we will also join Global XR conference on December 1st. So you can actually meet with the trainers and the graduates who have successfully come all this way in four months um, in a part-time bootcamp. And you can ask any questions there on December 1 uh, in Global XR Conference. Our team will also share the Global XR Conference uh, link uh, as well. So yeah, I think uh, we are good to go in terms of the uh, introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the Accenture team, Hunter, Sebastian, Fadi, for allocating time in such a uh, busy period. I know like you are uh, extremely busy right now. So every minute maybe counts for you and you have large scale projects that we will hear today. So thanks again for joining us. They have extensive knowledge on not only the technical side but also the project management side as well. Uh, and they are covering also different regions. So I strongly recommend that uh, anyone here uh, join us to ask questions. 
So after their presentation, we will have them also answer any questions that you have in your mind. Please, please, please uh, submit your questions on the Q&A tab rather than chat. So it will be easy for Fadi and me to, to uh, curate the questions and ask uh, and answer, of course. So um, yeah, Fadi, Sebastian, Hunter, stage is yours. Uh, you. Feel free to share the screen. Welcome to the Unboxing XR Day Carriers. So yeah, we are looking Fadi, forward to it. Yes, everything good. Sorry, Sebastian, did you say me? Um, I said Fadi. Oh, okay. okay. No, okay. Sorry, sorry. You, your voice was really low. I, I couldn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, fine. So I'll, uh, I'll start. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, really happy to be here. And uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, this session will be really uh, of, uh, of value for all of you. Uh, as uh, uh, Farhan mentioned, uh, we are from Accenture. And uh, we'll be talking to you about a multitude of things uh, that we do at Accenture, particularly delivering a, sc uh, a scale. Yes, we are busy. Yes, we have uh, uh, like tight timelines and deadlines, but of course we are happy to be here and help our colleagues in the community to learn and, and, and excel uh, and scale their expertise and uh, um, contribute more to the XR field because uh, the more we have people who are really well seasoned in talking the talk and delivering beautiful XR work, the better the industry will be. So it's, uh, it's our duty and our contribution to, to this uh, community. So thanks for having us. And I really look forward to, to your questions and answering and having us. So I'm joined here by my colleagues, uh, Woody and, uh, sorry, uh, um, Hunter and uh, Sebastian, who will introduce themselves uh, in a minute. I'll introduce myself very quickly. I'm Fadi, the XR capability lead in Europe. So I look after the team uh, in Europe and I look after XR for consumer experiences as well in Europe. Uh, Hunter, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so Hunter Woodley. Uh, I'm out of Austin, Texas in North America. Uh, I've been uh, working in XR for about nine years. Before that, I've been uh, in interactive media for about 20 now. Uh, I started my career in video games. Uh, I started in QA, then went, worked up to level design. The uh, three yard, uh, then game design, and then eventually branched off and <clears throat> excuse me, did production. Uh, I started my own small studio for about seven years uh, before we really w wanted to make a push in, uh, away from like uh, like mobile games and go into uh, into VR at the time specifically, and uh, uh, kind of everything that the stars aligned. Accenture and North America needed a uh, needed a capability lead, and uh, here I am. Uh, I work with a, a lot of uh, colleagues from my previous uh, career as a video game developer, and uh, been with Accenture almost five years now. Sebastian. Hey everyone, this is Sebastian joining you from uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, part also of the uh, global technology team. Uh, I take care of our markets in uh, Spain, Portugal and Israel specifically, um, working closely together with local colleagues here that range from uh, developers, designers, uh, business analysts, basically anyone who can help us to get to, to get the job done. And uh, I closely connect, of course, with, uh, with Fadi on a European level and Hun Hunter if we're targeting clients in, in North America, which sometimes uh, might happen as well. Um, I've joined Accenture eight years ago, um, ever from the start, been involved with, with AR, VR, um, started off with mobile. I joined Accenture, maybe good to know as well, throughout an acquisition. So I was part of a startup that got acquired by Accenture, which was solely focused on the development of mobile first experiences. And basically, since the since the iPhone uh, came about, uh, been busy building apps uh, together with engineers and designers. And ever since cameras and uh, the, the graphical capability of these devices got better, I expanded my uh, my expertise across the the multiple devices that uh, we can leverage nowadays. So yeah, excited to be with you here. And uh, well, Fadi, I'll leave it up to you to to do the intros and then the start, and then uh, yeah, I'll take over. So we've got uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, healthy and uh, quite a rich agenda for you guys. So we'll talk uh, a little bit about Accenture and what we do and how we do things, and then we'll dive more into the uh, team structure, skill set, uh, and how we do things. And then uh, from there, we'll open for questions and uh, 
uh, dive into more uh, detailed composition. So uh, XR at, at Accenture is a, is a large practice. Uh, we've got more than 350 people uh, uh, stand globally uh, from North America to Latin America. Uh, we've got people in Europe, in Africa and Asia and, and, uh, and Far East. So we've got a, a very good reach in terms of uh, where our offices are and in terms of where our teams are. Uh, these people range from developers to artists to designers to concept uh, designers, project managers, strategists, uh, you name them. Uh, I think this gives us uh, the advantage, I would say, uh, to be able to deliver at scale. Because when we talk about scale, uh, things are not uh, small in just one place. They might be actually uh, scattered globally. Having a presence in multiple offices will definitely gives us the uh, the ability to address that need and that uh, and that demand. Um, we work uh, with a lot of uh, the um, uh, leading partners in the industry, uh, and we try to keep conversations open. We talk with uh, startups, established companies, uh, uh, and big companies, small companies. We do not. Uh, say no to any conversation. It's very important to keep our eyes and ears open because this space is evolving rapidly and every day there's something new. Rather than us reinventing the wheel and deliver things uh, that can be costly and difficult to maintain, we try to partner with leading uh, organizations in their domains for us to be able to integrate solutions in a good way. And of course, because, because of having a, a large team, this is where you need to have that knowledge of partnership and, and solutions and uh, technologies to be dispersed and uh, uh, shared uh, uh, globally so that everyone is on top of the game. We'll talk about that in, uh, in later. Uh, as part of this uh, uh, expansion of like 300 people, uh, 350 people globally, uh, we have six unique capabilities. We can help clients in defining their strategies on how to enter into the XR space or how to allow XR to help them deliver experiences in their industries, whether it is consumer facing or whether it is enterprises. We try to work with clients, understand their needs, understand the problems they're trying to solve, and then basically uh, uh, put together innovation strategies or execution strategies for different flavors of XR. Um, uh, Sebastian will touch on the workflow that we use for that in a, in a minute. Uh, we've got uh, uh, lots of studios, uh, XR studios in the different locations that we've got globally. Uh, the, the purpose of these studios is to get concepts up and running as quickly as possible. So. Uh, Yes, some ideas might be POCs, others might be pilots, but others might be real production. These studios help us in getting these ideas out there as quickly as possible. Uh, 3D assets and content creation is crucial to us as it is for anybody in this industry. Uh, XR without beautiful content, optimized content, efficient content is just nothing. Uh, we've got a lot of expertise in this domain and we will talk about uh, the, the skill set in that uh, that area in a minute, but uh, when it comes to the art of 3D and the creation of assets, uh, we've got capabilities that help us uh, doing that at real scale. Uh, technology architecture, I mentioned our partnerships with different organizations. So this is the core and the crux of our architectures and our architecture and solutions because um, not having an idea of what is out there will limit the flexibility of the solutions that we deliver to clients. So we try to keep on top of things and we try to keep all of our solution architects on top of things so that we can deliver the right thing to the right uh, clients and how things integrate between AI, uh, LMSs, um, uh, CMSs, uh, you name it, we try to, uh, to, to handle that. Because we are Accenture, uh, we've got almost a uh, foot in every dom dom domain, so we can, tack up, we can tap into expertise within the organization for us to be able to solve problems regarding, let's say, um, integration with safe source or integration with the success factor and stuff like that. And of course, uh, Accenture has uh, a heritage in interactive and uh, experience design. 
and we try to apply these in our uh, projects. Uh, we try to leverage our extended teams from interactive who focus on design, user experience, uh, 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 visual design, experience design, etc. And last but, but not least, of course, uh, infrastructure and support. When we talk about scale, we need to be able to manage and help uh, our clients uh, uh, in their deployments and uh, maintaining these projects that go at scale, whether it is from soft software or hardware. Uh, we've got uh, uh, our operations capability that are uh, available globally as well that help us in all of these uh, matters. Uh, from capabilities, we go into the offerings that we have at Accenture. So we've got five distinctives, uh, distinctive uh, offerings, uh, AR connected worker or XR connected worker, depending on the, on the industry. Uh, this is where we give uh, people in the field, uh, the eyes and the expertise of those who are in the, in the office. So suddenly everybody in the field uh, has access to an expert engineer and they become uh, experts by themselves. So allowing them to do jobs uh, remotely. Immersive learning, um, this is where we have uh, simulations of certain scenarios where we bring people into these scenarios and let them train and learn in a safe environment how to do a particular operation. This is experiential learning, basically, not watching a video or reading a text. It's actually being there, doing it in a safe place and then gain, uh, gaining the skills. So next up for collaboration and events, this is where we have VR to bring people together into a space, uh, whether to meet uh, in the midst of, of COVID and uh, uh, isolation, uh, or to run workshops, design thinking, et cetera, et cetera. All of that happens uh, by bringing people virtually together into these spaces. And we've got the virtual research, uh, which is uh, more focused on retail clients. This is where we try to solve the problem of having a, a real physical mock-up store or physical uh, layout of, um, uh, of shelves uh, and bring people into that real physical space to conduct some research. Rather than doing that, we create uh, virtual environments and we leverage eye tracking uh, in order for us to be able to gauge people's performance and uh, test the layout of stores and shelves in VR and then provide feedback to the clients. And last, and last but not least, XR for consumer experiences and consumer journeys. Uh, this is where you have virtual stores, virtual spaces, uh, uh, virtual try-ons, um, and all the things that uh, touch the consumer. And now the metaverse, which is becoming a hot topic in the industry, is finding itself mainly in the consumer uh, space. Um, but also it's finding its way into the enterprise as Microsoft is trying to do with Mesh. Uh, next, Sebastian. Right, so uh, what does it take to deliver XR at scale? It's not only the capabilities that I just talked about and the offerings, but also it is um, XR technologies, the methods that are used in order to deliver these projects, the outcomes that you anticipate and you want to do, and most importantly, a one full integrated team, which is going to be the focus for uh, for this presentation. Um, I will hand over to uh, to Sebastian uh, before we jump to talk about teams. Hand over to Sebastian, who will talk about uh, briefly the the workflow of concept creation and how we handle that uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of skills and talent. Sebastian, over to you. yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Fadi, for that. And uh, yeah, what I would briefly like to share with all you all is 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 is, is a workflow that that we uh, regularly use, use, especially in large scale projects, that has proven time over time for us to be very efficient uh, and flexible, uh, depending on the type of use case and client uh, we're working with. Um, it's a workflow that basically takes the ambition to bring things to production and scale. So we really set a north star for ourselves to achieve that marketable product, let's say, and build it on the right foundation to, to release it to, to end users in a large, uh, let's say, uh, volume. And um, that starts for us with what we call a discovery phase, which can range, let's say, in timeline, depending on, uh, on the scope uh, of the project. But basically, what's, what's key for us uh, within such a discovery phase is that we focus on what we call define, design, and solution. 
define is really about bringing the requirements of the end user in scope. Working with the end user is key in this in this phase, right? So not just taking the requirements that might be given from a certain, let's say, part of the business, but really trying to, to, to take a user-centric approach in for who are we designing this with, what do they really need, and how can technology best serve uh, their purpose, let's say, uh, and enable them to be better in their jobs uh, than they already are. Then it's design, which is really around, you know, taking all those insights and learnings and make it visual. We start first with initial wireframing, as we call. So just trying to create a bit of sense of logic on all the, let's say, insights that we gathered and then visualize that in a wire flow that's, that we can validate with, with our customer, right? So it's we make simple clickable prototypes out of that, which allows us to, at a very early stage, validate whether or not we're on the right path here to take before we actually include technology in this domain. So this is all very quick and easy for us to see, uh, are we doing the right things? Uh, and are we setting ourselves up for success as we move along along this, uh, this workflow? And then uh, the third one, which is uh, one of the most important ones uh, to ensure scalability, which is solutioning, right? So it's it could be quite easy to define and, and design, right? Taking the learnings and the insights that you gather from the engagements that you have with your clients, but it really takes rigid research and, uh, and discussions around solutioning to ensure that whatever you're building and might look pretty on the front end uh, side of things, it should actually be able to talk behind the pretty curtain, let's say, to all the necessary systems and services that the client has, which might be outdated, which might not be optimal, let's say, for the solution at hand. But by bringing in solution at a very early stage, we can guarantee our client that as we go along this journey, you know, we're set up for success and the technology we're going to deliver the solution on actually is able to talk to the environment that the client has to offer. So, as we move along, then we, do, we dive into shaping, uh, which basically means we're taking all those insights and we're working with tooling like Jira, for instance, to have these requirements defined into user stories, as we call them, that take a user-centric uh, view and make it very clear to our teams and what it is that we're trying to build and what the value of it is as they're, uh, as they're integrating these features. Uh, we're aligning that with the Scrum team or various Scrum teams. We're used to working with multiple teams in large scale products like the SAFE methodology is, 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 a, is a proven methodology that works really well. And once we basically concluded our shaping phase, uh, we should have, let's say, user stories, features or epics ready to go to be offered to our team as workable products, right? So I think the key in completing this phase is, you know, you've defined your requirements uh, and as you have defined your requirements, Every single user story in Jira should be able to be picked up by your team. It cannot be a user story that just describes a nice feature, but then the service, let's say, that enables you to build that feature is not available or not properly configured, right? So there are very strict criteria that we set in each and one of these steps to ensure a timely delivery uh, as we move along across the workflow. And then eventually it's around building and, and testing, right? So which, which is an iterative approach and can vary in sprints depending on the type of project and the size of teams. It can be a two-week sprint, three-week sprint. We, we've done all of them, I guess. Um, and the integration work, right? So it's, it's, it's about merging our tech together with, for instance, the client's tech or actually establishing new tech in a client's ecosystem and then integrating it towards that and then eventually releasing it to the end users, the, uh, the most exciting part, let's say, of the, of, of the whole flow, making it available for our customers to actually test uh, and for us to learn on how it's being received. In the end of the day, I mean, there are many methodologies, there's many theory. Uh, I've been in multiple projects where sometimes, you know, the focus was around, we need to follow the theory, we need to follow the rules as set down by the book. I can assure you, uh, speaking from my experience, theory is important, learnings are important, but the end, in the end of the day, key in success comes down to collaboration and communication, both in beating process and both in beating deliverables. You need to be close to your team. You need to have a steady rhythm. And when you meet, what you talk about, respect your priorities, allow people to work, you know, and, and, and have a clear set of priorities when it comes down to your backlog with workable uh, items in it. That's that's really the crux of, of success, um, uh, in my opinion. Hunter, maybe over to you to speak about the team itself. Okay. All right. So 
to give you a little background, I've been putting together teams for games and, uh, and, and XR for a very long time. Uh, I, I don't have a, you know, a, a written playbook on what to look for so much as I know when I can identify someone who I think can be successful in what we do. And I hope to shed a little light on kind of what some of those things are to help you further your career and be more successful in your pursuits. But in the meantime, I'm also going to tell you about the type of teams we have and, and how they're made up. Let's see. Forgive me. How do I advance the slide? Oh, you got it? Okay. So if you look here, this is kind of an initial team uh, of what we would usually do with a lot of our clients. And what it involves is usually a proof of concept or an MVP, uh, something smaller scale in order to get some something done that, you know, can they can that the client can show around their company, get more funding, help get approved for something that comes more to scale. So uh, if you look here, we've got a senior artist and a junior artist. Uh, usually we'll have a technical artist in some form or capacity uh, involved if we need uh, help with, with characters or with, with optimization. Uh, you know, a character artist is usually you know, on the table if we want to have characters, obviously, or if we don't, they get cut. We'll have a senior engineer and junior engineer that are running you know, front end UI ex experience, you know, functions, features, and then a back end engineer, depending on you know, what we're going to be integrating with uh, and if we're going to be having a, a multi-user experience. Uh, and then uh, the management team then goes into like a delivery lead, uh, which a lot of times is also the architect at the beginning that's helping put together a solution for the client. Their job is basically talk, <clears throat> uh, making sure the team has everything they need to be successful, making sure that, uh, that things are going smoothly and then talking with the client. We have a project manager who's running Scrum. Uh, and then also we'll have QA that uh, goes in and obviously we'll, we'll make sure that the project is, is working properly. So here's the fun part is that those little teams a lot of times spin into something like this. Uh, it, what, what ends up happening is once we get the green light to go to scale, uh, we're using resources from the, the proof of concept to are usually uh, more senior, more expensive resources, but we can't staff an entire team uh, with, with people like that because it'll just be too expensive. So most of the time what we end up doing is we take people that were on the original team, they end up leading kind of the charge uh, as we you know, offshore a lot of these assets. So, and that's quite common. So, you know, with Accenture, we've got, you know, we've got offshore uh, delivery centers in India, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, off the top of my head, uh, that, <clears throat> where we can take a lot of assets at scale, uh, step and augment these teams, uh, you know, at a better price point. But uh, a lot of our, our, our original team ends up uh, leading and, uh, you know, lead, leading those engineers, leading those artists and, uh, you know, making sure the quality is there and making sure that uh, the, the project is being led properly and going in the right direction and also talking with the client. And then you'll see on the right, we have the different, uh, the different operations and management people that we have, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, in the United States, for example, we would have an onshore delivery lead and then an offshore lead to, to manage the offshore resources, resources, and then a project manager for each QA and, and and on and on. All right, so uh, here we have the core XR team construct. Uh, as we kind of touched on before, so we've got 3D artists. Uh, and you, I'll tell you a lot of things that I look for, especially uh, from in the Accenture space is it's good to have people that can wear a lot of different hats. Uh, you know, working in video games, especially large scale video games, it was very common for someone to be specifically, you know, a character animator or a character creator or an environment artist or, or you know, or a 2D concept artist. Uh, if someone can show that they have experience in the diff in different areas where if we needed to utilize them uh, more beyond just being, say, a, an environment artist, that's very helpful. Uh, it's not mandatory. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, we don't expect you to be a master of all these things. But if you do have any type of skill that can be uh, that can be be shown that, uh, that you have some competency in, please do. 
uh, you know, because a lot of what our, you know, our process is, it starts out with concept art and then it goes into some sort of prototyping, uh, then, you know, environment art and then so on and so forth from there and there. And, and anybody that we can utilize on a team that has multiple skills like that, that's great. Especially when we have a client that comes to us and says, I don't have enough money. And we're trying to just make it work so that we can get to the next step, which is usually a, a larger scale endeavor. Uh, but I digress going into uh, kind of the skills that we're looking for. Uh, you know, we say a design and concept creation, you know, 2D skills and being able to convey kind of what you're going to be building is very important. Uh, iteration, you know, art dev workflows, uh, that's all kind of part of it too. Uh, you know, we have people that use a mix. Most people use either Maya or 3D Max. A lot of people use Blender because they're self-taught or they don't have the money to, to spend on a, you know, on a 3D Max license. And so that's great. Uh, we don't have anybody currently on the team, but I would not turn my nose up on it uh, at it if, uh, if somebody was a, a Blender master. Uh, Substance Suite is important. Uh, you know, the days of us creating, you know, custom textures is really kind of behind us. Uh, Substance is, uh, is a big part of what we do. Uh, you know, make sure that's something you brush up on. Since Adobe uh, has acquired Substance, it's a lot cheaper to get a license. Uh, ZBrush is another good one for doing, you know, a, a lot of these kind of, uh, high resolution models and, and, and touching up. Uh, it's not necessary, but it, that's a good one to have in your back pocket. And then we go into the different types of disciplines, environment art, character creation, animation and rigging, which usually uh, a character creator doesn't animate and rig as well. Uh, texturing and li uh, lightning, la li lighting is very important as well. Uh, lighting is something that I'll put a high emphasis on, especially since using uh, something like a Quest 2 where their, where their chip does, you know, uh, their graphics chip does a lot of great things, but it just doesn't have like a lot of the, uh, the nice touches that uh, you see on something like, like a desktop uh, graphics card does. So, you know, it doesn't matter how, you know, impressive your, your environment is, if it's lit uh, poorly, it's not going to look well. So uh, that's something, that I think that's a soft skill that's really more important than people give it credit. So it, I, I would brush up on that. And then, of course, being able to optimize. What we're finding is that I'm, I'm utilizing a lot of people that have been in the industry a long time. Uh, for example, people that used to work on, say, like a PlayStation 2, because they know the tricks of the trade. They were having to work against the hardware in order to make sure that it ran properly. And we're running into that again uh, with, you know, with say like the Quest 2, uh, because we are limited. So it's about being able to get most bang for your buck uh, out of what you're creating. You know, I mean, it, the days of, of being able to kind of build it, uh, you know, and it, it, it push as many policies as you want are kind of behind us, at least for now. I think, you know, with, with edge computing and everything, we'll get back there. But for now, you need to be very efficient in what you're building. Uh, and that includes textures, that includes objects, you know, and that includes code as well. Um, so Unity Unreal, um, you know, those are our, our foundational uh, engines that, you know, are pretty obvious in, in our space. Uh, metaverse is stuff that's kind of, that's obviously a very, uh, <laughs> a, a very catchy word right now. But I mean, that is something that we are, you know, Give, you know, dumping heavy, heavy consideration into, and then of course technical art. Uh, never underestimate the power of some being a technical artist, or at least having those skills, being able to write scripts and optimize is very important and, and very well valued. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, 3D engineers, um, you know, this is something that's that's important when I talk more uh, about. Uh, being able to, you know, do do full stack. I mean, uh, if you have somebody who's a front end developer, that's great. But if you can do some back end as well, those people are are very uh, very valuable, especially especially at the beginning of, of projects. Uh, but you know, the different things that we need to uh, look for is people that can work well to other disciplines, especially artists. Uh, you know, like uh, networking and multiplayer. I don't think we're really building anything from scratch, but being able to use something uh, like like Photon and be able to integrate into the uh, project is is important. That's so the only one we use is just pops up the top of my head. Yeah, back in front end, uh, you know, that's very important to be able to do both. It's not necessary, but it'd be a huge help, uh, especially at the beginning of a project. But as soon as we start going to scale with something, we usually have dedicated uh, assets working on the back end and front end. Um, Unity Unreal, uh, AR Kit and AR Core. Let us not forget that, uh, you know, a, a consumer AR is, is on the horizon, it seems like perpetually. But, uh, you know, it, it will eventually uh, get here. And uh, that's, as we all know and, and suspect, it's going to really change uh, the landscape of what we do and also uh, just, just, you know, the world in general. 
um, you know, Web 3D, a, a lot of times what we end up having to do is people will want a VR version of something, but then they'll also say, well, not everybody has a headset. So we need to have uh, be able to solve for that. So a lot of times we'll make a WebGL version as well. So being uh, well versed in, in WebGL is important, or uh, some type of uh, you know you, you know uh, I wouldn't say edge computing, but some sort of offsite computing solution. Uh, Furious uh, with uh, is something that Unity acquired is something that we're using as well. So those are good to be familiar with as well. Uh, game mechanics, logics, tricks, optimization. Again, uh, I always perk up when I see a resume of someone who has experience in the game industry. Uh, that, that's, it shows that you know you've you've worked on a, a larger scale product, um, something that's a, a, a more of the wild west. You know, you're, you're it, it, what we do is a lot lot more um, organized, and and our sprints are, are a lot more. Uh, <laughs> a lot more painless, whereas with video games, I mean, you're getting thrown a lot of curveballs as you work, and it shows that uh, yeah, you can work in a different environment on something creative that's not always tangible, and that, that uh, in my opinion, that uh, translates very well to what we do. We can go to the next one. All right, so spatial designers, uh, they're really kind of the ones leading the charge here. Uh, they're the ones at the, at the front of the uh, of the project that are working with the clients and working with the people in Accenture to make sure that we understand what it is that we're building, that they understand what we're get, what we're building and and how we deal with you know the the, the obstacles along the way. So uh, it's very very important, and this is across all of these different disciplines. Is that you have great uh, interpersonal skills and you're able to talk with. Uh, people of different disciplines and also a client. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people, when I worked in the game industry, they like to put their head down and they like to code or they like to do art and, you know, and just kind of just crank and really not be bothered. And that's great. And I understand that, but that's just not something that really flies with what we do. You, you know, everybody at some point is expected to talk with a client uh, or, you know, uh, with someone who doesn't know what we do. And it's important for you to be able to, uh, to do that concisely, succinctly, and, uh, it, you know, in, in a way that, you know, you're not talking, you know, programmer talk to a client, they, it's, it's very important. And while, you know, you can do very well here for a certain amount of time, I mean, if you're wanting to build a career in Accenture, you know, that's very important. Anyways, I digress. So back to, uh, no, sorry, we'll go back to designers. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th this is where it begins, you know, it's being able to, to you know, sort through and get what the design is gonna be. 2D concept art is very important. Uh, prototyping quickly to kind of convey features of what they want us to create, as well as us trying out things and see how they work. Uh, you know, storytelling, you know, again, yeah, it's, it shows your client relations. It's, it's a very front end heavy uh, and difficult part of the process, but I cannot stress enough that our designers are very important uh, and they are constantly being sought after and praised for what they do because it's, it's so important for every project. You know, the next one. Okay, so architects, uh, that's very important again at, at the front end because we're identifying like what the actual, you know, I mean, most of y'all know, but like what the actual hardware software solution is going to be from, from start to finish. Now, uh, a lot of times this will be different if we're doing a proof of concept than when we go to scale. Now, what we're finding is, uh, you know, as we are st starting to get a lot of these projects that are going to scale, you know, you're inheriting a, a, a entirely new set of, of issues beyond how you just simply create the product, how you create a, you know, a VR experience or AR experience. Because once you go to scale, you're having to integrate with uh, within a, another company's IT, uh, within their firewall, you have to work with LMS systems. I mean, there's a lot of very meticulous things that we need to account for that we might not have a solution for yet. I mean, that, uh, you know, Oculus for, uh, for business has been something that's been ongoing, but we're still having to kind of use gum and sticks to get a lot of this work. So uh, you need to be, uh, you know, very cognizant of what your issues are going to be beyond just architecting the solution, uh, you know, uh, as it's encapsulated as just making an experience for someone, you know, how many employees, how are we going to roll that out to them, you know, so on and so forth. Are they going to be on site? Are you going to need some sort of uh, an instructor in the experience with them are they going to be on site? I mean, these are all things that uh, <laughs> open up and make the uh, and make the experience more challenging. We go to the next one. 
So uh, testing and QE. So uh, testing is kind of an unsung, unsung hero. Uh, and a lot of times I find on, on previous pro uh, projects, people will say, oh, we just all kind of sit around and test it. That's not going to work. You need to have dedicated people that have, you know, uh, that have test plans and understand what it is they're looking for, whether it be usability, whether it be technical optimization, all these things, very important. So, I mean, a dedicated uh, testers are, uh, are, are very integral in what we do. That might be it. Uh, adjacent team construct, <laughs> forgive me. So, oh, very good. So this is what we're talking about beyond development. We've got, uh, we've got leadership and we've got third parties and suppliers. That's very important, uh, obviously, because we, we have headsets, we have different supplemental software uh, suites that we need to use, integrate. So our ecosystem is important in being you know, integrated with them. Uh, there's the client team. So the way Accenture works is every account, or every client has a team of people that's uh, dedicated to them. So you're having to work with them as well, not only them, but the client uh, you know, and the, and the, uh, the development team. Um, you've got legal and HR and change. I mean, uh, th that's a big part of it too. Uh, you know, right now we're trying to integrate, you know, third-party software into a project, and it's being put through the ringer through uh, through legal to make sure that uh, you know that we're kind of covered from a legal standpoint, and also that uh, this is something that's going to uh, you know be scalable within you know with the client long term. You've got creatives, obviously, and you know, that's going to be your people that are helping with workshops and also people that are helping develop yeah, and their operations and security. Uh, that's that's a huge one, especially uh, as of late. You know, anytime you hear, uh, you know, uh, about an article about, you know, there was a security breach, it's a bad hickey uh, for, you know, for obviously for that product. But if you're using that product, if you ever have a security breach with a client, you jeopardize business big time you jeopardize your team it's embarrassing beyond that and um, you know it can it can really come back to bite you if you're not careful cool. all right well thanks for that hunter um Farhan, just 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 checking in with you because we're running a bit over and i don't want to compromise the q a we have one more section on uh our recent new joiner experience um but um yeah please uh, let me know if you would like to jump to the q a we can very quickly go through that in the next maybe three four minutes and then sure. Yeah, we will have 35 minutes yeah. uh, to yeah. really, so um, like, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, we are sure. no, I well. mean, whatever Hunter just mentioned already, I have even have a lot of questions. So <laughs> uh, yeah, happy to, to continue. Very good. Okay, well, briefly for everyone then. So we wanted to bring in one case study, uh, which if you follow the news, uh, you might have uh, read or seen videos around this. Uh, Accenture has been quite in news recently about our new joiner experience, NJX, uh, as we uh, as we call it here. Um, because um, as you might have read, uh, we've invested significantly in making uh, virtual reality available to our own uh, uh, employees. If we look at last year, FY21, which basically stands for our previous financial year, we hosted over 100 client events in VR, especially the pandemic, uh, you know, shifted us to, to think more in, in leveraging uh, the uh, VR as, as a means to, to come together with clients and connect uh, throughout various experiences. Uh, at the moment, uh, tens and thousands of headsets are being deployed to our colleagues across the world. Uh, it's a huge investment uh, we're making in training. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, at the moment, already more than 22,000 new joiners have experienced uh, this, uh, this new onboarding, uh, let's say, uh, experience in, in Altspace VR. So it's, it's really significant if you think about the volume uh, that we're dealing with here. Now, in doing so, we wanted to create a, an inspiring home for everyone that joins Accenture and, and receives such a virtual reality uh, glass on, on their first day. So we created a one Accenture Park uh, for them in which on their first day, they're able to meet their future colleagues, leadership, and learn all about Accenture in this inspiring dome. It's, it's really cool. It has various, let's say, areas that, that, that allow you to get to know the business and uh, what Accenture does on a global scale. Now, dealing with such a large scale project also brings in a lot of learnings for us, which I just briefly want to share here with you, uh, because at the very start, it all comes down into engaged leadership and the, uh, and the key stakeholders. Um, as we go along there, um, it's important that we determine if we go to such a skill, so basically 10% of our workforce is going to receive such a such a device that we think about hardware, software, which 
so, uh, which, uh, which of both is capable to deal with such a sheer volume in, in people. And then as we move along, as, as Hunter already uh, briefly told you, it's not just necessarily around the skills in the teams that can actually make this work, that can create one Accenture Park and all the logic that sits within it, but it's also around including HR and IT to make sure this syncs up with all the processes that we have in such a big business as Accenture, right? Because it's not just the asset and the experience, but it needs to be integrated into somebody's onboarding package, which is now remotely sent to everyone across the world. It needs to be integrated in any messaging they might receive beforehand or uh, when they just signed their contract. Um, and as we move along, you know, we've, we've grown this project into piloting with, with, with hundreds of people, gathered that feedback, making sure, you know, our IT organization was, was looped in so that security elements were properly dealt with, that it's easy for people the moment they receive a headset, that they can just use the credentials. They're also used on any of the other, let's say, um, hardware that they have received. And then slowly, you know, starting creating the uh, the experience, and uh, yeah, also think about a bit of a support line, a support line, because if you have tens and thousands of users in your organization that uh, that will embark on this new joiner experience, we need to ensure they can reach out to certain people uh, in case of questions, both hardware and software related. A couple of things that uh, that are key in, in enablement is, of course, secure account management, um, central management of devices device connectivity uh, and data privacy. And um, I think what's, what's key to mention in there, as we distribute these has, headsets across the people spaces, we're dealing first of all with private, uh, private Wi-Fi networks, uh, which we have to ensure that whenever, wherever they connect to, you know, it's safe uh, and, uh, and, and the experiences cannot be compromised. But then also if they decide to take the devices to our own environment, our own offices, which have different uh, grades of security, of course, when it comes to connectivity, we need to make sure these devices can talk to that, let's say, environment and are able to, to log in and have a, a pleasant experience as they would have in their own environment. Now, we need to be able to all know where our assets are, right? Uh, we need to be able to test and understand how the platform is performing and making sure this is all well integrated in their total, let's say, workstation offering. That's very quickly it from my side uh, with regards to the presentation. So I would say let's uh, let's go over to the uh, the Q and A. Perfect. Okay. I mean, we have already some questions. Maybe uh, Fadi, uh, you can guide the questions according to the uh, relevant uh, speaker, and uh, I can also have a few questions. But yeah, um, we can start based on your uh, maybe direction. Sure. I've, I've been trying to answer those answer, uh, those questions that uh, we can answer in the chat directly and uh, reserved some questions to be shared with the team here. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we have now thirty minutes, so I think yeah. there are very interesting. Some of the questions are very interesting that we would love to maybe um, start. I mean, which one you want to start? Which one is? I'll start with. Um, what are your expectations for Meta's interaction SDK? Do you think it will become the standard. Uh, not sure if uh, if you, Sebastian, or Hunter, want to to jump on this. Uh, I can give an opinion. Uh, so my issue here is I think that the way that Meta is approaching the metaverse is, is flawed. Uh, I think that the, the reason that the internet uh, did so well is because it was decentralized and uh, everyone was given the opportunity to share experiences or whatever they wanted uh, with, with very little, uh, you know, uh, over, oversight from a, from a big company. And so with Facebook trying to kind of corner, uh, you know, what Meta is going to be, uh, you know, and it's questionable what their what their interests are, but I, I would suffice it to say they're just trying to find ways to get your money. Uh, I don't know if this is the, the right way it's going to go. I don't think you're going to see a lot of content creators that are really going to want to adopt Meta's tools, you know, understanding that it's about data mining and there's a lot of different aspects there that, uh, that uh, you know, they don't want to have to really deal with. So uh, I think, it, will it become a st the standard? I, I don't know in the long, in the short term, possibly, but I think long term, we're going to see more decentralized tools in order for this thing to be successful. Thank you, Hunter. I'll jump to the next question, which is, I think, uh, 
a uh, very interesting one and a very valuable one. Um, aside from experience in game development, what are some of the best skills you would advise someone to learn when starting out in VR development? The skills that are maybe less obvious, but really impress on a resume or CV. Uh, I, would, I would say ha having some sort of, uh, even if it's not a professional project, but having a portfolio of work that you can speak to about specific features or things that you did and so that if you, let's say if, yeah if if you, as it pertains to like an engineer where i you could talk to my lead engineer and discuss you know what you created what you did what the feature entailed in in detail so they might go well that was pretty impressive so it doesn't have to be that you worked on a professional team but have some sort of portfolio of work that you can show uh then the same with for 3d artists if you don't have an online portfolio i mean i hate to say it, but but my my lead artists are like nope in the trash so you've got to have something that we can look at and at least give a quick litmus test and go, okay, this person has some talent or this person needs to work on their stuff. And if you don't have anything, then yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty fast no. Can I, can I just add on top of this, uh, two things that I really uh, look for when I, when I try to recruit people, communication and uh, eagerness to go and, and explore new things. This space, is evolving at a pace that is unprecedented. Every day there is something in here. And now with the metaverse coming in, uh, maybe every half an hour we'll, we'll, we'll hear of a new technology coming through or a new standard or a new thing. So I focus on the first line, communication. If you think that you can just like enclose yourself and just go and develop this task and that's it, two weeks later you, you can deliver what you've got, you will fail in any team, not only Accenture team. This space is all about creativity, sharing ideas, uh, not taking things personal. So you just need to be very open of expressing your opinions, ideas, etc., and let that communication flow between developers, artists, management, leadership, etc. You you should not be sitting in a silo. That that is one of the most important things for me. I look for, and then the second one. Um, uh, curiosity and being able to explore and, and search. Uh, <laughs> we, were, we were working on, on, on the project exterior, which you see uh, the background uh, here, right? And this is like uh, XR in, uh, digital, uh, for digital fashion event that we are, uh, that we are helping hosting. And we created very nice uh, 3D worlds, as you can see in the, in the picture, on Altspace. My team knows enough about Altspace. Then URP came through. And everything they knew about other space was thrown out of the window. And they said, what do I need to do now? How do I change this? How do I optimize this? Uh, the, the size has just tripled out of the blue. So they went and they just did not fear anything. They were so open to explore and learn quickly and experiment and evaluate, etc. So never say never to anything. Always be open and have that uh, mentality of like, I'm ready for the unknown. I will dive in and I will come out with trophy. Hey, to add to Fatty, uh, what are you saying? Uh, I have a steadfast rule. The one thing that will get you hired or not hired faster than anything is you have to have a good attitude. Uh, you have to be a positive person on a team. They're, uh, you know, you know, bad attitudes are toxic and, and they're, they're infectious. Uh, so you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be the fastest. I will work with you as best I can. But boy, oh boy, if you're a negative uh, force on a team, I'll, I'll get rid of you fast. <laughs> and I don't mean to be draconian about it, but you all have worked on teams. Most people work on a team where someone is just, you know, poisonous. And you know what it can really do to affect creativity when everybody's working hard. You can't have it. Brilliant. And then uh, another one that's more technical, how do we deal with complicated CAD data, mainly with the optimization and the simulation part? Uh, that's an interesting one, right? We, uh, we had many conversations about that, I think, especially uh, end of last year. Um, I mean, it depends a bit on the, the tools that we have available. There's, there are various tools that can help us to speed up the process by initially co uh, compressing, let's say, such complicated models and then make them more, let's say, digestible for the type of interface uh, we're, we're developing with. Um, but we also have developed our very own assets uh, that allows us to basically input any type of, uh, of, of file type and then have it unified in a certain format. 
that makes it digestible uh, for any type of interface. We can apply compression to that if we want to, if that's needed. Let's say if you're developing for a device that doesn't have that much CPU, uh, but we can also keep it at the original quality and then just have it high fidelity available. So various ways to go there uh, using the tools uh, at hand. Uh, Hunter, if you have maybe some more thoughts on yeah, that. It, yeah, just to kind of supplement and agree with what you're saying. There, there's no silver bullet for doing this. You know, there's different products like Pixis, uh, yeah, you know that 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 you know promise to do a lot of this, but uh, to be fair, we haven't really used it on a on a on a large scale project yet. Uh, we do have a lot of people that have a knowledge base of what their pipeline to do stuff like this is, like how they deprecate a model, how they get into real time, and this and that. And um, you know that if you can if you can demonstrate that. Uh, then I'd say that is just as valuable as like demonstrating, you know, using one, one, one software suite for this. I mean, because we're still trying to kind of figure out a lot of this stuff as we're going to, and uh, showing that like, look, I have experience in working with CAD data and being able to get it to run in real time, regardless if it's something that we adopt or not shows that you're, you're being, uh, you know, you're, you're being innovative and you're, you understand what needs to be done to, or what, what, what practices need to be done in order for us to just get a result. It's all about getting results. Well, like, there's another question about optimization and it says like, uh, do you use any tools for 3D programming optimization or do you have standards defined and check those manually? Uh, maybe I'll just jump in here uh, to answer this because I'm currently dealing with, the, with this for another uh, project. Um, it depends on the models that we get and it depends on the industry uh, and it depends on the team, right? Uh, sometimes uh, automated tools um, uh, like Pixies, for example, can automate the thing for you and it's up and ready immediately. But sometimes you really need to do retouching, you really need to uh, refine some bits and pieces, so it requires some manual work. Sometimes the, the models and part are really easy to optimize manually and do not justify the, the cost of a license, for example. So it depends. Of course, having a standard of uh, how many frame, uh, frame rates, uh, frames you want to, to run, uh, what is the size of the file that you want to have, how big are the materials are, because when we talk about 3D models, it's not just about the, the mesh, it's also about the, the material that dresses up this mesh, which, which might be very, very complicated as well. So this is the art that 3D, our 3D artists luckily uh, have masters in the last uh, uh, years. Uh, we've, we've got a, a very talented team who can tell immediately, well, for this, I, I will do it manually. I actually try to challenge lots of artists like, no, 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 no. It's cheaper for me to, to, to pay for a license than you spending a couple of days. Believe me, Fadi, even if you do the, the uh, uh, even, even if you pay for the license, I will need to revisit it manually. So yeah. Yeah, I trust the experts and I go with their suggestions. So it depends. Yeah, uh, when you are talking about talents, I also want to invite Jeremy as well, because uh, we have taught a lot while creating an optimization, uh, rendering optimization for standalone XR class. And uh, Jeremy actually give us a lot of uh, advice on what to add there and which kind of like topics. So I would like to also invite Jeremy here. Hello, Jeremy, how is everything on your side? Hello, good. Anything that, wanted, this, right now, but... <laughs> anything you wanted to this anything you wanted to this question on your side uh which on question sorry the optimization it was about uh, it was about optimization do you use tools or do you do it manually uh mostly manually and then when you really need to dig deep because a lot of times you're just there's a lot to build you got to build fast and there's plenty of like optimization techniques to employ and not enough time to employ them all a lot of the times. So it just kind of depends on the scale of the project. So you kind of build towards it. But I I usually don't, you know, I use some basic tools for it uh, just to kind of see where I need to optimize. But um, it's not often I have to dig in too deep unless like it's a bigger, longer, you know, more production kind of big scale project. Uh, the kind of the quick stuff, you know, you, you tend to just use what you know. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that I'd like to add since this optimization is um, like what we are doing in our class that we have 
created all these like uh, techniques that you can use, like a, think of like a checklist that you are going through. And at the end of the class, we give people like uh, an quest based, unity based experience that uh, has an amazing visual, but runs at five frames per second. So they have to somehow bring it to 72 frames per second or 90 frames per second based on the techniques that they learn. And what we have seen that um, there are actually uh, a lot of um, artists or designers uh, who have maybe limited uh, development experience would like to learn this because from a company perspective, from a large scale project perspective, as far as I have understood from uh, their need, the more that the designers art department handling uh, the optimization, it is much better in terms of budget as well. So you don't need to make all, all the work done through your uh, programming programmer team, developer or engineer team, which probably they have more limited time or there's a, uh, so much uh, in demand on, on uh, that department. Are you seeing the same uh, approach? So uh, do yeah. the optimization on the art side, design side, as much as you can before delivering to the engineering team. Is it something yeah, you, that also... You yeah, so yeah, you have to you have to be developing or, and creating the content with optimization in mind the whole the whole time. If you just make something and then try to optimize it and it's it doesn't have that in mind uh, in the beginning, you're going to end up doing a lot of work over again. Like you're going to be re rebuilding a lot of things, or you know, there, there's to it, at least the way op I optimize. It, I'm I always have things. In, built in an optimal way, but I'm not, I'm not too stressed about it completely, but I get it like as far as I can while still moving quickly. And then, cause you know that later you're going to have to do an optimization pass anyway, cause you're going to have to like bake textures down to an atlas and, you know, batch things and you have to do all this stuff anyway. So you don't want to waste time doing that up, up front. You want to kind of keep your speed going. And then just yeah. when you know you're in a place that like these are, these assets are going to be in the experience we're not going to change any of this so let's start kind of combining that but if you were to start and not and everything's like way high poly or more high poly than it needs to be you're going to have a rough time you're basically going to have to re redo everything again if you're not building in that way from the start yeah and uh, I, I don't know if you Jeremy agree with me but um, this is why we have uh, uh, good 3d artists and amazing 3d artists uh, when you have, when you have, uh, uh, when you as a as a as a 3D artist understand how Unity work and you've got experience on how to bring the 3D spaces into Unity and experiment with, in parallel to you doing the 3D artwork in Maya or something, that will give you uh, a, a, an upper edge. Same way in the past we used to have good UI designers and excellent UI designers. Those UI designers who know HTML and can script very quickly yeah. how the website would look like and then dump their UI designs and test and experiment. This is this is the same analogy here. So we need to have this uh, uh, ex ex expertise. It's not it's not a must, but it's of course a good 3D artist and an excellent uh, 3D artist. Perfect. I, I'll just jump onto one of the questions yeah. about um, uh, uh, what are the spatial experience. Uh, sorry, special designers currently expected to use for prototyping. Um, maybe I'll answer this question if you don't mind, or I'll, I'll start uh, finding an answer. Um, and this maybe ties into that question uh, or that point that I've just raised as well. Uh, when it comes to creating spatial environments, it's very important to think about the, the psychology of people who are in that space. The same way architects, building architects, right, think about congestion, uh, light, ventilation, and all the stuff in a physical space. Now, we're not gonna have all of these senses in VR, but it's very obvious when you are in like a claustrophobic place or a narrow tunnel and an open space that is welcoming and accommodating. So when it comes to uh, spatial uh, designers, uh, there are a number of, um, uh, of 3D prototyping tools that are available out there. Maya has an extension that you can you can plug into VR and then uh, and then see. But also there is Tivori slash Shapes XR, uh, which is a great tool. Uh, there is also uh, Menzar, and I think Menzar has basically uh, been deprecated or something. 
uh, and there is, uh, of course, a sketch, uh, a sketch based 3D, right? Uh, these are some of the tools that are available. Of course, if you can create in 3D and bring into Unity, then you've got more control over that. But there is a, a little bit of learning curve and friction if, if you want to do that. By the way, I just shared Fadi's uh, Medium blog uh, link. I strongly recommend that you read some of his uh, blog posts, especially the one with participant experience. I think yeah, it's quite interesting approach as he mentioned never hesitate to share your perspective because nothing is set hard in stone yet so uh, i shared the link oh, i hope it will be inspiring for designers here uh, there is a very uh, relevant question here as well uh, can you suggest a roadmap for for beginners to start to learn xr for a better career Airhound, <laughs> do you know a company? <laughs> I mean, uh, for us, what we can say that the, exactly the things that you said, guys, I mean, what we believe is maybe it is a little bit, um, how could I say, shocking a statement that I will do right now. For us, we believe that any designer, UI, UX designer, without pro enough prototyping skills have a limited chance in terms of employability in today's XR industry. Uh, because the industry is growing bigger, but the companies, when you look at that, they are not as big as Accenture, right? They may not afford to have a specific role, a designer role, without any prototyping skills. Because keep in mind that every time that you realize your design idea, prototype your uh, design idea, and you need another developer to justify or validate if your design idea makes sense in a real-time 3D environment like Unity. So what we believe is that's why no matter what a designer or developer coming to our beginner program, we are first teaching prototyping and scripting no matter what, because this is the typical uh, in, in understanding from the industry, and we, we get this feedback from many industry, uh, Ill, like uh, different uh, parts of the industry. So that is our approach. Become a self-capable prototyper first, then your design skills, then your subject matter expertise on medical or other uh, areas makes a lot of sense, maybe much better than a developer. That is our approach. I don't know uh, if you are agreeing, but yeah. That's, uh, I can tell quickly. Brilliant, I think uh, that's uh, comprehensive enough. So the, the courses are on XR Bootcamp. Yeah, uh, we, we can talk about this in 20 minutes, guys. So if you have any questions about XR yeah. Bootcamp, we have an info session. So let's focus on uh, large scale XR projects and yeah, skills. Uh, uh, there is another question. Uh, what kind of development life cycle do you see in comparison to a typical uh, software development life cycle? And at what stage spatial experience des uh, spatial designers come into play? Hunter, do you want maybe to answer? Sorry, I was actually answering questions, typing them in. Um, what, what was the question again? Right. Uh, so what kind of development life cycle do you see in comparison to uh, a typical uh, software development life cycle? Uh, well, you know, we're seeing that the, the, the full gamut of things, you know, uh, for example, when we're doing these initial kind of uh, engagements, uh, they go anywhere from, you know, uh, three to six months, you know, when we're creating a proof of concept or we're building a foundation for scale. And then beyond that, it goes for years. Uh, you know, once we start really building things out that a company is going to integrate in their company, you know, globally or, or nationally or whatever the case may be. Um, that's, that's, it goes from months to years very quickly. Uh, you know, we've got one project we've been on for uh, about three years now, another one that we just, uh, there's a contract for two years and, and they're wanting all XR solutions, AR, VR, you name it. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the smaller projects are kind of more fun because you can kind of go from thing to thing to thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, the scale goes to years. And there is another question. What are the differences in the key skills you should have between developing for entertainment and research? Uh, maybe Sebastian, uh, given, given your background in interactive and uh, 
and the entertainment that you guys managed to, to, to deliver, this could be like an interesting question for you to answer. Yeah, sorry, buddy, I'm a bit mobile at the moment. So uh, could, you, could you just rephrase it? Right, okay. Uh, what are the differences in the key skills you should have between developing for entertainment and research? If you are mobile and can't answer, maybe I'll, I'll just chip in very quickly, but let me know, uh, Sebastian. Yeah, maybe if you can chip in, I'm... Uh... Okay, okay, yeah. fine, no worries, no worries. No worries. Right, okay. Uh, if, first, for, first of all, uh, I have spoken to many people in, the, in, in research and uh, PhD candidates or PhD graduates, etc. One thing, uh, I did my PhD myself, and I know how much my PhD and my research really benefited me. I, I did. I started my my uh, my research in XR, augmented reality, mixed reality, and mobile phones, back in two thousand four. And since then, I was always curious of learning and finding and identifying things, and always researching and reading, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of that gave me solid foundation to, to be able to contribute to the team that I am part of here at Accenture. So. The thing that I always get from, from, from people in the research space, like, oh, will I be able to work in the industry? They, they somehow undermine themselves. Look at yourselves, guys, as real elite because you are focusing on learning and, uh, and upskilling and, and developing your skills. Yes, maybe not as, um, as deep as developers who are focusing on development all the time, but you are acquiring different skills. Nevertheless, um, what sort of skills? Uh, when it comes to entertainment and when it comes to research, there is one thing that is common. Researching, finding trends and, and analytics and analyzing what people are doing, what people are expecting for you to come up with a theory. This theory might be creative idea that can entertain people or this theory might be something more academic, right? So the key skills, all right, uh, in developing for entertainment and development of research, uh, are not that much different. It's just like how you reutilize that skill in a different context. So being always explore, exploring, learning, uh, attention to details, etc. It's very important when it comes to entertainment because you want to come up with something that is new and fresh, but also for research when you want to, uh, uh, to, to, to come up with a, a new theory or a new uh, um, uh, research topic. Uh, right, okay. Um, what can I have one? one question quickly because it's technical, maybe it might be really relevant. Um, is it better to develop VR with separated SDKs such as Quest, Vive, HoloLens, or use OpenXR? What is your approach to the um, SDK toolkits decision making? Because this is something that we are discussing always in our advanced class live sessions as well. So sometimes it is better to build your own framework. Sometimes it is easier to use an existing framework, which maybe may or may not uh, continue in the next few years. And you are building this for a large client. Uh, you are always relying on an existing toolkit. So what is your approach about that? I think this is a very interesting question. We use all of those. Uh, it's best to have some uh, level of knowledge on everything uh, because it depends on the client. I mean, if you do an Oculus versus a tethered PC headset, I mean, it's um, you know you you got to do that, and it, vice versa. If you if you're using a Vive, uh, you've got to know that. I mean, Hololens is its own thing. Um, you know, and, and OpenXR is you know it's Microsoft's. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, bottom line, sorry, I'm kind of, I'll digress. I mean, it's best to have a working knowledge in all these things. How about the toolkits? Like the interaction toolkits, for example, what is your approach there? Are you preferring to uh, like use the existing ones or? Uh, yeah, you know, we built our own for a long time, but then every time somebody comes out with something new, it just gets deprecated. And, um, you know, but we are kind of getting to a point where we don't have to do that as much. We were, we were ahead of the technology as it was coming out, and we had needs and things that we needed to, you know, to do. But now we're starting to see, or I personally am starting to see, a, you know, a standardization of tools coming out that we can use regularly so we don't support our own stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. One chip uh, from, from my side coming from the mobile, let's say, uh, industry, a discussion we always had between going native and, for instance, PhoneGap or React and React Native nowadays was also like really about how much actual power from the silicon do you require for, the, for the, let's say, the experience you're developing. Going native can provide benefits in, in going that route, right? But it's not that, let's say, easy to export across across various, uh, let's say, uh, devices. So I think it's also, also always a question like, you know, do you really need to get the most out of that specific platform, which then a more native approach can be definitely uh, of benefit or, you know, the level of features, you know, and intensity that, that the experience is going to require can, can work just fine on a platform that is more cross, cross over the place, let's say. Uh, there is another question. Uh, how hard it is to find suitable XR engineers since this field is fairly young? How long are you typically looking for people for? I was just writing an answer to this. Uh, you know, if somebody has experience in Unity or in Unreal, or they worked like a 3D platform, and they, you know, in the in the past, it's it's very easy to transition into an XR career. We all started that way. We all started doing this previously, and then just kind of bumbled through learning how to do uh, VR. So, um, if someone's more junior or the, the, or or even mid, and they're looking to get into the space, I, I wouldn't say that it's a it, you know, it's something that's going to keep you from getting a job. A lot of these things we can share with you, the, the pitfalls and problems that we ran into. Uh, so uh, I, I think that it transitions nicely. I wouldn't be as concerned, but always try to work on your own to try to get more experience. That that only helps. Uh, if you can pick up and do some things on your own to learn more about VR design, that's, that's a great help. There is another question that follows this one. Uh, and I think it was uh, asking specifically people who have front end uh, web development, how easy it is for them to, to, to jump into XR development. Uh, yeah. I, I would I'm say, up, by <laughs> bye, Jeremy. Uh, I, I would yeah, say, do. thank you. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that's a hard question to answer for everybody. I would say if you can, uh, if you can start learning Unity or Unreal, uh, I'd say that's the best way to go. I mean, it's kind of hard for us to say, oh, well, this person's web dev, they can just jump in and start doing stuff. And we probably can't, uh, unless you can show that you have work, you've done work already and can, um, uh, so that's what I would say. I would say learn Unity or Unreal on your own. Um, that's maybe, something that's, that's gonna um, help tremendously. Yeah, maybe I'll add to this. Uh, I actually had a conversation a couple of months ago with the uh, local team in Italy <laughs> who wanted to build uh, XR capability. And they are mainly front-end and back-end developers. Uh, to, to, to Hunter's point, like you need to go into, un into Unity or Unreal, but also there is the Web 3D, Web XR, uh, uh, Play Canvas, uh, web-based tools that allow you to develop sort of XR. And we are seeing a lot of momentum in that space as well. So my recommendation for them was go into Unity and Unreal yet, leverage the existing knowledge that you've got in order for you to be able to be productive as soon as possible. Because learning Unity, but also learning how to do 3D and matrices and, and, and vectors and all that stuff is, is a huge learning curve for a person who, who has been focusing on 2D all the time. So understanding the 3D mechanics, uh, using something that you're already familiar with, might speed up that, that process for you to get into that space. And then later, if you're not content and not happy with developing for the web 3D, then that's where you could potentially jump into Unity because you've acquired some more relevant uh, understanding. <clears throat> One yeah. quick, sorry to, to interrupt. One quick, uh, like a, a statement that I heard from Nick Rosa, he's also from Accenture and he's on our advisory board. Uh, two years ago, when we were discussing what kind of classes that we are uh, like building, he said that, Unity developer or Unreal developer is not, are not equal to a VR developer, right? So we should clearly understand that even the people coming to our classes as Unity developer, we are still putting them to intermediate and advanced classes. Of course, it's a huge advantage, but this doesn't mean that you can immediately break into the industry. I strongly recommend that you build your portfolio towards 3D more. So don't uh, like apply with 2D. Uh, unity based 2D games, so it will not work. So that's a quick, uh, like, a statement from my side. 
yeah, spatial design and spatial implementation. Um, and I will say this just as an anecdote. The first thing I look for in every single resume is, do you have Unity or Unreal experience? And if I don't see that, unless we're looking for somebody who's specifically like a web, you know, AR developer, then that's something different. But Unity, Unreal, uh, I look for Unity if that's not there, I look for Unreal. If that's not there, then yeah, I mean, I move on. Yeah. Perfect. So let's, um, I mean, there is a few actually of our students, graduates, uh, who is also on the round table now. Maybe anyone who wants to ask in person here, because we have maybe five minutes left before finishing the uh, session. Anyone who wants to jump in and ask questions, or we can continue taking a few more last questions. Please feel free to jump in. Um, hello. I, I would just I, like I to... Know. Yeah, hi everyone. I would just like to add one thing about uh, learning uh, Unity and Unreal. Um, one of the things that helps always is to have some sort of community. And that's why these sort of courses in XR Bootcamp is an example, but if you have find other places as well, that makes sense for you. We, we cannot hear you right now. No, we cannot hear you. I think your microphone just... Okay, um, maybe when you are fixing, we can, we can have another question. Sadik, would you like to, since you are the, one of the recent graduates that create this game room experience, so anything you want to ask here? Hi everyone, so uh, I quickly want to ask because uh, as Fadi mentioned about uh, uh, switching from research to uh, uh, to industry, so I'm also in a sort of like a starting push phase of it. So I'd like to have your opinion on like how to go ahead to keep up with, uh, especially after research three or three years in PhD, four years in PhD, and uh, how to cope up with the speed of a developer. Like what skills to upskill, and uh, like yeah. So what would be your advice on that? Uh, the question here, do you want to be a developer or do you want to be something else? Actually, I want to uh, be a developer. So once I, uh, so during the course of my PhD as well, I was developing uh, Unreal experiences. And then when I started learning uh, Unity, the more I develop, the more I love it. So I don't feel the time passing at all. So sort of right. like passion. So I, I want to keep continuing it, even though it's a little bit of different direction. I want to keep keep on doing it. So uh, Can I yeah. ask what what was your PhD in? Just quickly. Uh, it was about uh, it's on mainly on uh, robotics, and uh, I was working on developing uh, algorithms for translating uh, for motions to motion simulator. So basically, a robotic platform. Okay. Uh, yeah. So 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 my my my, my uh, given given your background, I mean this robotics thing. Uh, it has a it has a lot of AI. It has a lot of three uh, D. It has a lot of spatial awareness. It has a lot of detection, uh, and you're doing that in Unity. So my recommendation for you is maybe to build more on the architectural side. So think about think about solution. Think about your solutions as an architect, right? And build that architectural skill because. If you just start as a developer with all of this information, all of this knowledge that you've got, then that's somehow gone wasted or not leveraged nicely. But if you upskill yourself to be uh, more on the architect side, then you understand 3D, you understand all of these technologies, and then you can advise on building the solutions. Of course, you will need you will need to build your development skills in order to be able to do things. But uh, thinking thinking as an architect with that host of, of knowledge that you've got will help you in getting there. Uh, I started I started as a developer and slowly slowly I went into into architect roles, right? Uh, but also I, I had love and passion to UX. I was focusing on mobile, right? Uh, and I was doing mobile development and UX, de UX design for, for mobile development. Hence why I've got this passion to spatial experience design, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera now. Um, but I was trying to build two skills at the same time, which took me some time to, 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 to get them. Uh, I wasn't focusing on development as much as focusing on these other things, because I knew that uh, 
Isaka development. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved on to uh, to other more uh, more interesting uh, roles. Great. So thank you. Um, one one more question, which we are asking in every un, uh, unboxing XR Dev Careers event. If I'm a game developer, you are doing as Accenture amazing things, but mostly on enterprise. What is exciting there that makes me? transition from game to enterprise, first question. Second, what it takes for me, let's assume that I know 3D game development uh, on Unity, what it takes for me in terms of skills that you need if I would like to become an enterprise XR developer? Uh, I can feel the first one about making the transition. So I think it's all about personal perspective. Uh, when I began working, I was I was and still am very passionate about game development, uh, but the there was a lot of things about it that were that did not weren't, weren't conducive to my lifestyle, especially after I had kids and got married, which is uh, you know there was projects that I crunched for months uh, every day and worked past midnight every day, uh, you know uh, beyond that there was no guarantee that a project was going to do well. And there was a lot of things out of my control that could affect that project, whether it's marketing, whether it's just design, whatever the case may be. And so at the end of the project, if it doesn't do well, we were always worried about getting laid off, yes. always. Yeah, I mean, and that was a constant thing. So, you know, and I'll be honest, I mean, the, the money in the game industry, a lot of us were working because of passion. It, it, I, I didn't get paid well. And so, I mean, Accenture, you know, and moving over to enterprise provided me the opportunity to continue doing what I do and getting to be, you know, uh, you know, creative and still work with this stuff that I'm passionate about, but with a lot less of the things that just, you know, got to where it was just too difficult to do. You know, I, when I say we don't crunch, I mean, we'll work late, you know, here and there when we have a deadline, but we're not talking about weeks on end. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's a much, you know, it, five hits, if you've done your work, you go home and you leave it. And I mean, and that's a much healthier environment. Our, you know, our plans and our, our project uh, plans are meticulous and detailed. So, I mean, there's no surprises. Everyone gets their work done. Everyone works hard. It, you know, the environment isn't as stressful. Everyone takes criticism well. It's just, it's, it's all in all a healthier environment for me. Uh, and I can't say that for everybody. Uh, but you know, for, for where I am in my life, it's been a it was a it was the right transition to make. Great. So we are getting a lot of positive feedbacks about this session. Unfortunately, we have to end in maybe the last one or two questions, Fadi. Uh, we can always have another session if there is a huge interest. But uh, especially this honest uh, feedback from you is really helping a lot for everyone. So. Um, any last questions that when you look at, you would like to answer or what are the maybe one key takeaway that we should take from this session or when you look at your career or your, the, 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 the uh, applications to the Accenture positions in the last couple of years, what are the biggest mistakes or biggest things that we need to be careful about while applying or while uh, building XR projects? So is that a question for us or a question for other people? No, no, for you, for you, for no, no mistakes, of course. We are extension. We don't do mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, from a from an applicant perspective, what um, makes me fail in an interview with Accenture? Right. Okay. Um, for I mean, for me, for me, if if the person is is not communicating his thoughts and his solution in in a structured way. And I need to ask multiple questions for, for me to get the idea across, then that's a no-no definitely for me because that, need, that person will need a lot of hand-holding throughout the basic tasks, which is daily communication. So, yeah. so, so, so that's, for, that's for me. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, there's been uh, interviews I've been on where somebody's giving me yes or no answers you know, uh, and I'm having to pull information out of him. I'm like, I'm done here. You've got to be able to to convey your thoughts and express yourself. 
uh, you know, concisely and, and in a personal manner, because if you can't do it to me, you're definitely not going to do it to a client. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry. Yeah. How about the technical wise? Like, can you give some hints about uh, like technical in a typical technical interview that what kind of challenges waiting for me or what kind of like questions waiting for us? I don't know if you can reveal today, but any at least uh, some hints how we can be prepared for a typical adventure technical interview i would say i mean I, i can't tell you about questions you can ask but you what you will be asked is to be able to demonstrate work that you've done and defend and explain it in detail on a technical or artistic level because mm -hmm. that above anything shows us that you know anybody can kind of you know fluff up their resume But if you can cite specific things that you did and talk about them on a detailed level, that's going to get you much further than anything, okay. in my opinion. Is it also including my GitHub portfolio and no. my, portfo uh, my normal portfolio website as well? Anything you can show and talk about, yes. Okay. Yeah, GitHub's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And if you, if you add, let's say, to your portfolio sp specific projects, be honest and transparent about the role that you had in that project, right? Because it's, it's easy to add yeah. a lot of projects to your portfolio, yeah. but the projects you really led or contributed to, those, those are the ones, you know, that, that, that you should be able to, to defend. So, so be honest about that. Yeah. Are yeah. you looking at if I uh, build projects for a large client or for a Uh, like a large number of headsets deployment or is it not so critical it is something that you are they are learning along the way when they are at Accenture I think it depends on the role you know I mean if you're coming in as a mid-engineer or, or artist we don't expect you to know all of that uh, but if you're coming in as say like a like a, an engineering lead um, yeah that's that's experience that we're going to need to lean on so mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's it's something that I would recommend you know getting more acquainted with as time goes on, but not entirely necessary every time. If you can express that you have, you know, great talent, you know, those are things that we can bring along. Okay, okay. Any last comments from our speakers before we wrap it up today for today? I mean, we will continue with the info session, but I just want to uh, uh, not take so much of your time uh, since we are already uh, over time. Any last comments or anything that you would like to add? I would uh, just say uh, for everyone, just don't stop learning and uh, don't stop being curious uh, and always think strategically in anything that you want to, to learn or do. Like, will this benefit me and benefit prospect clients in terms of... Uh, uh, career or in terms of value to, 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 to them and to, to their clients, uh, will I contribute and really build and help accelerating this metaverse uh, stuff? Uh, I'm pushing a lot on the metaverse at the moment, so <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's, it's my, my key, ta my key uh, takeaway and my key uh, message that I try to, uh, to communicate with people. But yeah, just keep learning and uh, Uh, always question what are the right things for you to learn and, uh, and excel at. Perfect. Yeah. I, would, I would say never lose the perspective that you're working with something amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, a job can always be daunting and, and tiresome because, you know, we, ha we have to work, but we get to work with something so special and, uh, you know, and, and creative and unique. That's uh, yeah. always remember that. Yeah really uh, some piece of advice that we cannot find in a blog article or in a, a normal uh, like a channel social media so thank you for for sharing all these details uh, from our team Roger also here with us so we will do an info quick info session after that but I would like to thank all our speakers today for not only being present and spending time but also being very honest of uh, what they are sharing with us uh, about the answers to the questions. Like I think we answered uh, over 30 or 40 questions, including the written ones. So um, I know that there are a few more questions left, but we have a Discord server that we will continue to, to get these answers for you. So feel free to continue the discussion there. And I would like to thank to everyone here and uh, speakers joining us. And um, for those who want to 
continue the discussion. We will be on the info session and we will answer much more XR Bootcamp related stuff. But uh, I would like to say good luck, Accenture team, especially in November. I hope that you will survive. <laughs> but after that, so holiday season coming. So see you in the next event, Sebastian. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. So we have uh, not so much time left, uh, but yeah, 15 minutes before we, we start the launch party. Uh, so um, before maybe going to that, maybe um, I would like Roger uh, to maybe answer a few questions before we, we go to, through the, all the details, um, because he has to leave in 15 minutes for the for the um, party, Cybrix new game party for those who haven't seen Cybrix uh, before. Um, we, will, uh, we will reveal that in 15 minutes in Altspace. So our team will share the Altspace link in case you haven't um, maybe registered there. So uh, regarding some questions, I mean, I think we, we, we really answer most of them, but um, anything that I'm looking at right now that we should I mean, the skills portfolio, we, I think we definitely mentioned about that. It's all about um, how you explain your skills. I think we have realized that in the, in the prototyping session bootcamp that we have just finished every week, our students had to pitch their prototype to us. And we have a lot of uh, good cops in that uh, pitch session by our trainers, but bad cops as well, who will actually criticize you. So you will actually have a lot to learn in our uh, prototyping uh, bootcamp that you continuously prototype. Uh, I don't know anyone here, um, maybe Sadiq since, or Joseph, since you are, you were just in that sessions. So how was it for you to be challenged every week with another prototype and with sprint uh, sprint sessions. Anyone, Joseph, would you like to chime in? Uh, well, for me, um, it was more my first real time getting in that sort of development environment. So really um, first time I've had to experience that sort of, okay, you have a task to do, you know, trying to actually put it together and then have it within a week. Um, and to add on to that, to have a lot of being able to come up with your idea to begin with, uh, if you weren't taking one of the predetermined ideas, which was encouraged to try to come up with something new. Um, so like even in my first week, my I took part of what one of the, the prompts was and changed it slightly and then wanted, you know, made it more of a game-like sort of thing and tried to put it in practice. But as I soon realized that um, what I thought I would be able to do in a week as opposed to what I could actually do in a week were two very different things. Um, so just getting that learning curve for especially in the first one or two weeks, understanding, okay, what can I do in the time that I have, and then focusing your design or your prototype in a way, such a way that you be able to get what you need to done to be able to get your idea across is definitely the, the biggest aspect, I would say, in terms of the class. So like by my first week, I didn't really have the concept together. I just had some mechanics to show that didn't really get the idea across as opposed to my fourth week when I actually had something that got the idea across, looked well, played well, even had some sound in it too. So yeah, going from that to that was very useful. Okay, great. Um, Roger, would you like to add something from mm -hmm. your side? I mean, there's not much to add, right? Um, so I haven't taken the class, right? We were more like uh, um, helping with the class just to make that clear. Um, and. I think for us as uh, as teacher or mentors, uh, the most exciting is always to see how much, I mean, having a class is always great, right? It's a good starting round. It, it gives you enough background to actually be able to create something yourself. But uh, what was really exciting for us to see that even though it was not a clear path given to each student, each one grew in very different ways. Um, there were certain students which lacked certain uh, skill sets or never really dabbled into certain aspects of prototyping and they took it upon themselves to challenge themselves and like, you know, look deeper into something they're usually bad at. And the first week, to be honest, it often didn't look that great. We could clearly see, okay, you know, you tried the first time. Great that you tried now in the second prototype, we saw a lot of improvements. And then in the last okay. prototype, you really could see 
they manage to overcome their, you know, inner barrier. And that is, um, when, when we created that class, we, we were hoping to see that outcome. But when you create something and you have certain like illusions in your brain of how amazing it will be, it's very rare that you actually see those fundamental aspects come to fruition with the first like group of students, which really benefit and really take uh, the advantage of challenging themselves and taking the help of the mentors as well as just like taking the time to really work through their limitations and being aware of their limitations, because that is one of the biggest weaknesses when you're good at something. It's so easy to just continue doing what you're really good at already because it's way less painful, but you also learn that much less through it. Um, and it started with the prototype and then when the groups came together and actually worked in a team on those projects, I mean, it was very evident how everyone managed to progress, not just with their own prototypes, but also like as a team, when they learned all the challenges. And for us, it was really exciting to see because it's very rare that um, you see someone grow so much in such a short period of time. And we, you know, we really look closely about the skill sets. And that was just for us really exciting to see uh, when the whole thing basically came together. And I think everyone had a really nice experience and also how the students treated each other with a lot of respect and with a lot of helping each other out rather than, you know, a competition. It was, there was some competition between the teams, but more in a friendly way, which I think is, is overall very helpful. So I was really happy to see. But enough about me. Let's let the students speak. Exactly. Uh, so uh, for me, in four weeks, the one thing I learned is uh, how consistency can improve your skills like 10x. And uh, having to talk to a mentor every day, having to interact with the team member and uh, be more consistent and learn or focus on uh, focus on the things you, as Roger mentioned, like you think you should improve and weaker was the best thing happened to me, actually. And uh, so and also you should know when to stop. It's easy to get into the rabbit hole. And the mentors are always there like, I don't don't do that. You'll get into the loop. That's the most valuable thing I learned. Like even. Nowadays, when uh, when I work with my team, even in the university, like it's easy to say, okay, this is going to take a longer route. Let's have the first thing ready. So even not just in XR, but also in my research, also it helped a lot. So that's one thing. Uh, yeah, consistency and learning where to stop was yeah. one thing which I learned. Failing fast in a supervised environment, we are calling it. Yeah, I think uh, that's interesting. There were a few questions. So there are many people here maybe who have zero coding experience coming from a maybe designer background. And is it for me, right? Maybe you are asking that. I think uh, instead of me or Roger uh, answering this question, I think we have a very uh, like a um, perfectly fitting uh, uh, student which, who is now graduate from the class uh, who were designer now become a prototyper in four months. Uh, Emma uh, is with us, so would you like to share a little bit about what were you lacking in the beginning and what happened in these four months that makes you grow for the XR industry or becoming a prototyper? Yeah, sure. So I had um, some design experience, but like Farhan said, I basically knew zero coding when I started this, and I was very nervous about that. And definitely very anxious like i felt like i was never really smart enough i guess to learn coding or anything tech related and mostly my comfort is with art but um over the course of just failing over and over again kind of like what mohammed was uh hinting at i think i i realized that um it's actually not so different and um Coding is also like a very creative process where you have to go over iterations and cut out all the details you don't need and try your best not to go into rabbit holes and also research for references. So it's just like when you design something, you want to find a reference that matches what you're aiming to do. And then you do your best to either learn a new skill or copy that. And um, yeah, coding is pretty much the same process. So I definitely got more comfortable about it, but I've also learned how much I don't know, which is actually a good sign. <laughs> but um, I'm definitely happy because uh, I really feel like I picked up a new skill 
And of course I have more anxieties surrounding it now, but they're new anxieties. Hooray. <laughs> I mean, if, I, if you ask to Roger, who has an extensive um, experience, you don't have an anxiety. I, I remember that when you are creating network physics and multiplayer networking, Roger, I think even senior people have these anxieties. As long as you're an XR developer, I think it is a, it is a it's an eternal thing, I guess. You never stop learning. I mean, the, the, the sad thing is the deeper you go, the more you understand what you don't know. And um, I mean, we, we are not new to the field, but there's always someone in the world which is better than you at something, which challenges you again, and you want to learn from those people. Um, and, you know, there's coding. I, I know many think it's it's mathematical and it's just like pure coding, but, but coding is also a piece, uh, some kind of art form uh, on its own, because there are uh, infinite amount of solutions to the same problem and some are more elegant, some are absolutely ugly, but quick. And there is always a different way to approach a problem and solve it. And even though you can follow tutorials and all of that, the only way to learn that art is like how you learn to draw, right? It's repetition, it's looking at good examples, getting inspired by things and then trying it again. So programming is the same. And yes, it's frightening. Sometimes it's very confusing and sometimes you really want to throw the controller against the monitor because that thing just doesn't make any sense. And then it works and suddenly, and you still don't understand why it now works and it didn't before. Um, and you, sometimes it feels like you wasted the whole day without achieving anything, but that's part of the journey. And every one of us goes through it and having, you know, someone with you on the journey, which go through the same and you can, you know, scream out to while things don't work the way they should and they listen to you can sometimes be helpful in the learning experience. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, we will see one example about that as well uh, in a, in five minutes, I guess, uh, about how learning and iterating can lead to a game that is released on App Lab. So we will be seeing they will actually release their uh, a little bit like a evolution of how the evolution of game uh, happened in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, before that, Alvin, uh, would you like to say? Uh, Anything about your experience for the since you're also a recent graduate from the uh, four months bootcamp? Sure. Um, I would have to say that <clears throat> I actually had a great time, um, you know, kind of figuring things out, even though um, I'm probably the one who had uh, the most difficulty in just um, kind of getting through it. A lot of it um, was really about, you know, learning new things, learning how to. Um, you know, what, what's involved in like, let's say building out a multiplayer, you know, how, you know, it, it's not something that's, you know, easily done, like in, in a day or two, it's, it's actually something very, very incredible. Um, I also had, uh, you know, some experience building out the AIs for um, our enemy systems in um, the project that we did. Um, so overall, I think it was actually a great course. I've learned a lot, um, you know, highly recommend it to um, anyone who, you know, is looking to kind of, you know, further their uh, kind of game development into VR. Perfect. So uh, we will wrap it up in a few minutes. But um, before that, I also would like to tell uh, what is next step, right? Okay. Uh, I'm in, if you are saying. So the first thing that we did is actually create, creating of like a free coding course for you to challenge yourself. This is actually a new program for us, uh, but it will be a self-paced format. And we all learn together on our Discord server as well, in addition to the uh, course material that we will provide you. Uh, but why we created this, uh, maybe we can a little bit talk about that. Um, in the meantime, maybe Rahel, can you also share the, 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 um, the slide so it, it may be maybe meaningful for everyone. Um, Roger, anything you would like to say about what it, how, how we will learn what it takes to become an XR prototyper in this course? Yeah, I mean, I can say like, what was the main motivation to get a class out there which like teaches basically the fundamentals of, of getting to learn how to program out there for free for anyone to test themselves. Um, the main challenge we saw that not everything is for everyone, right? Uh, it's absolutely fine that I have, I know people which are very creative, which are very capable, but just writing code or prototyping is not for them. And that's absolutely fine. And sometimes you cannot know that without trying it, without 
putting yourself through something. And we want what we always want is that someone which takes the class succeeds in it and has a lot of fun while doing it, challenging themselves and failing a lot. Yes. And feeling sometimes a little bit depressed that things don't go the way they should, but overall that they get something out of the class, which they really enjoy and can enhance their skills. The one which depresses us the most or makes us really uncomfortable if someone just doesn't manage because it's not the right thing for that person. And if someone like, you know, came into the class with a lot of hope and if they would have just had the chance to test themselves and figure out for themselves beforehand, if that would work for them, that they actually would enjoy coding, then it would remove all that pain point, which we saw sometimes happen. And that's why we create the class, which everyone can have access to and challenge themselves and see if they could become a prototyper and have fun doing it. Uh, we are pretty sure that if you enjoy this free class and you will get excited to learn more about it, you will probably master and excel in the prototyping and foundations uh, classes because that's basically the foundational bound building bracket, which you can test your own brain if it gets basically the right endorphins um, expelled while doing those challenges. If that's the case, then you will get hooked, you get addicted, and you want to have more. And that is great because then you're ready to go on with other classes and join us into that industry to be one of the first ones where coding is still required to get out new and exciting prototypes. And that was the main idea. And now I have to go because the other event is starting yeah. and we're hosting there a little yeah. bit. So we are also wrapping up in five minutes and then we will see you there. And Hopefully we see each other there on the yeah. land. Bye -bye. Thank you, Roger. Um, yeah, last part, maybe uh, after taking this free course, of course, we have full experience that our students uh, has just finished. Uh, and uh, maybe we can go to the next slide, Rahel, to, to, to show. I also share the Discord server. And if you want to join this free uh, coding course that Roger mentioned, feel free to register, apply there. I mean, everyone is welcome. We just need to um, enroll you in the next uh, week. You will receive more details about the course. So after that, the Foundations Bootcamp, right? That you are learning the tools um, and Unity and coding development related stuff uh, from interaction toolkits to locomotion to many other um, features of uh, VR development that you need for, for your uh, path towards becoming a prototyper. And uh, this is a two months program, Foundations Bootcamp. And afterwards we have um, prototyping bootcamp. We can also quickly mention that our team um, mentioned. So yeah, let's show from the, directly from the um, also uh, our brochure, please feel free to look at the brochure to have more idea. So prototyping bootcamp is a little bit interesting. Instead of uh, learning different uh, tools, you are now implementing and executing what you learned in the first two months. So um, maybe we go to the prototyping one. Yeah, this is the foundations. And yeah. Uh, yes, this is the prototyping. So every week, you are creating another prototype in another use case. It was quite a challenge. I mean, we expect you, especially if you don't know coding, to invest at least 20 hours per week uh, to, to enable that. But there are people who had full-time jobs and survived from this class or full-time studies. So uh, this prototyping uh, is a four weeks um, part of the bootcamp and every week, you are first pitching your idea and you are implementing in one week. Think of like you are in a continuous hackathon uh, four weeks straight. Um, and afterwards we have MVP phase. This time you are not alone. You are joining forces with the other team members and you learn how to work on a team in a, a harmonious way, uh, which we already discussed some of these things in, uh, in Accenture session a few minutes ago. And in this session, you have one month to build an existing prototype that you have built uh, to make it polish and then make it a fully working MVP. And you have one month, but every week you are still uh, joining the weekly sprints. And the interesting part is every day we have daily standups, which means that you will, you will get in a simulation as if you are working on a, a VR, 
development game or enterprise uh, development studio. So that is the part that you will fail a lot, but you will learn a lot and you will gain experience. All of these experiences that we mentioned here, of course, people may prefer to um, like gain this experience in a longer period. If you have two, three years to, to really invest, I think this is something that you can gain as well, uh, like by yourself, with self, um, self uh, learning and maybe joining some internship sessions. We just want to create a program that we know that in four months you become XR, junior level XR prototyper, and you become at least in a level that you are employable, as long as you commit to the bootcamp, of course. We have assignments, so you need to really fulfill the assignments. Uh, so this is our goal, that we created a skill to job journey for you. And um, our also career support service is also in place for all our graduates. So this means that we have unlimited career support till they get their first XR uh, related uh, job interview. And we also have headhunters, so we already start guiding them to the relevant um, uh, opportunities. But the most important part is, as, as Accenture mentioned, it's all about creating a, a stunning portfolio. And whenever you are in the interview, explaining that portfolio to, to the interview, uh, uh, like interviewers. I think this is something that needs practice. And yeah, we, all, we are already starting this um, these uh, mock uh, interviews as well with our uh, our uh, students, so they will have uh, a lot of like exercise on that as well, and um, as well as we are guiding them to the relevant portfolio piece, which they can already use the existing four prototypes and one MEP that they built during this four months period. So um, I think uh, we have to wrap up today. Uh, but please join the discussion on Discord and find me. My name uh, is Farhan is written on the XR uh, Creators Discord server. So please feel free to um, reach me anytime if you have any questions, if you want to join in the next cohort, which is starting. The, the C-sharp course is starting, uh, like the onboarding process starting next week. And the uh, bootcamp, full bootcamp experience starting on the 10th of January next uh, next year, let's say, early next year. And for the advanced courses, we didn't go into that detail, but you can also check our advanced courses if you are already an experienced XR developer. I think I talk a lot and we need to party. We, we have to a little bit relax after that. Anything uh, that you wanted from our students, graduates, any, any last reminder for those who wants to join to this program? How can I prepare myself? One sentence, anyone, any advice? If you're going, if you don't have any coding experience, you definitely want to take the foundations first before moving into the prototype. You don't want to think about doing the, the prototype without the, some sort of coding foundation first. And then when you come into the prototype, be expected to say, okay, you are a developer now basically, and you need to put the stuff out there the instructors are there to help you when you ask for it, but otherwise it is a matter of you learning from experience. So be ready for that. Yeah, I will say, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help or ask questions. Um, Farhan and everyone else is there for you. So if you have any questions, Bell, just be shameless and contact people. <laughs> yeah, I would also have to say that um... Also be, uh, try to think of everything as simple as possible. Don't um, get yourself too wrapped up in something that is too complicated. Um, it'll end up kind of shooting you in the foot <laughs> later on. So just, um, you know, that's actually, in, in my opinion, a, a skill is really just trying to simplify things to its um, kind of smallest uh, possible working unit. So um, that is something, um, you know, you should come in, um, you know, understanding as well as you'll also get practice kind of putting that into practice. Um, yeah, scoping. Yeah, this is probably one of the most like uh, revisited subject that we always go through in the sessions. Anything you want to add, Sadiq? 
So I think anything you wanted because we have to wrap up now. I think he's disconnected now. Okay, so um, anyways, we have to wrap up anyway. So alt space link you already have. So for those who have time, we would love to uh, celebrate uh, with you. So thanks for joining this long session. I hope it was uh, beneficial for everyone. And yeah, see you in the next uh, unboxing XR Dev Career session. And uh, feel free to ask any question through Discord. Let's continue the discussion there. Bye everyone and have a very nice day.